Boa tarde a todos. Boa tarde. Tudo bem? Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Bom rever a todos. É, depois de um breve intervalo, e para mim, para a Lu, Luciana Chimenez e para a Isa, é uma alegria imensa da gente retornar ao inacreditável terceiro ano do Teaços. Né, Isa? Né, Lu? Nem na mais otimista expectativa e desejo a gente poderia acreditar que nós chegaríamos aqui três anos seguidos, com encontros quase sempre semanais, trazendo para o público brasileiro, do modo mais acessível possível, mais democrático possível, grandes nomes do mundo junguiano contemporâneo, grandes nomes do mundo junguiano brasileiro, novos nomes. Então, estamos aqui renovados, desejantes, e quem vem com tudo não cansa, né, Luciano? Então, vamos lá. Hoje a gente vai ter o imenso prazer de receber a Susan Schwartz. Susan, vou fazer a sua apresentação. Seja bem-vinda. Susan vai falar sobre o livro dela, A Ausência Paterna e Seu Efeito nas Filhas. Desejo do Pai, Feridas do Pai. A Susan é analista junguiana, psicóloga clínica e membro da Associação Internacional de Psicologia Analítica. Ela lecionou em vários programas junguianos e apresentou workshops e palestras nos Estados Unidos em vários outros países. Susan tem artigos em várias revistas, capítulos de livros sobre psicologia analítica e junguiana. Ela tem esse livro, né, publicado pela Rutledge, em 2020, e a sua prática analítica privada é na, no Arizona, nos Estados Unidos. Susan, é, antes de dar a palavra para você, eu vou convidar a Aline Carneiro, que trabalha na Editora Vozes, é responsável... Aline, me corrige depois, tá? Responsável por toda a sessão de tradução, aquisição de livros. O seu livro está sendo publicado, está sendo traduzido em português. E eu convidei a Aline para falar um pouquinho sobre esse processo. Tá bom? Aline, senta-se à vontade, por favor. Eu agradeço o primeiro convite. Agradeço pela presença da Susan. É uma honra poder ouvi-la. Agradeço o convite do Marcos. Acho que a gente tem um trabalho assim que dá até para estabelecer um paralelo nessa busca de, de sintonizar um pouco com as demandas do que as pessoas querem ouvir, no, no seu caso, do que as pessoas querem ler, no meu caso. Acho que entender um pouco das demandas da comunidade, expandir para diversificar autores, diversificar temáticas, é algo que a gente tem tentado fazer. E, nesse caso do livro da Susa, a nossa tentativa de ir para temáticas que consigam trazer para o leitor brasileiro é, questões mais da clínica, questões que os pacientes trazem no cotidiano da clínica. Eu acho que a, a voz tem, tem expandido um pouco para essa linha, que era para a gente uma lacuna bastante grande. E, e o livro da Susan, acredito que vai ser uma obra que nessa linha supre bastante essa necessidade. Né? É um livro, o Marco já falou um pouco, eu não vou entrar aqui no conteúdo propriamente dito, mas um pouco no estilo da Susan, que foi uma coisa que cativou quando eu é, pude receber o original para leitura, né? Ela tem um estilo muito envolvente e traz toda a teoria, todo o arcabouço teórico, mas também traz muito de relatos, traz contos de fadas, traz poesia e, e acredito que os Jungianos contemporâneos que consigam trazer tanto essa esse contexto teórico, também as questões contemporâneas que a gente enfrenta como comunidade é, precisam de um espaço e, e a voz tem tentado é, trabalhar para expandir esse esse espaço. O livro dela está sendo traduzido, foi aprovado no ano passado e aí o, o trabalho editorial às vezes demanda um pouquinho mais de tempo, né não, não dá para a gente conseguir é, é, publicar tão rápido mas imagino que ainda nesse segundo semestre desse ano 
o livro já esteja disponível, esse livro do qual ela vai falar hoje sobre a relação com, com os pais ou com a ausência do pai é, na vida das filhas. Eu agradeço mais uma vez o convite e vamos ouvir a Susan, né? Obrigado, Aline. Você é sempre bem-vindo aqui no Teatro, tá bom? Estou sempre aqui. <risos> Obrigada, Marcos. Susan, prazer te receber. Sinta-se em casa. A gente falou ano passado, né? Para você vir apresentar no Teatro, tem um longo tempo. Finalmente chegou a hora. É uma grande alegria e para nós um, uma grande satisfação te receber, tá bom? Fique à vontade, a casa é sua. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to put my screen on right now. And uh, just one moment, please. And here we go. So I want to thank all of you for having me. It is my absolute pleasure an honor to be able to be with you today. Uh, I can't tell you enough about how much it means to me. So what I'm going to do is present uh, a bit of what does appear in the book that has been mentioned, which will come out this year. But I would also like to say that it is on the darker side. It is the shadow side. It is the piece that we don't often speak about, so it is going to be really very one-sided. And what I address actually is absence. And I would like all of us to think about what does that really mean? This is a quote from Jung who said, but there is a darker side of the father, sometimes negatively stretching out toward his children, active in the disturbing Greek myth concerning Cronus and his attempt to devour Zeus. As I begin, and this is a picture of Zeus, of course, as I begin, I would like to give a quote from Jean Paul Sartre, who said, I now exist as myself, for my unreflective consciousness. It is this eruption of the self, which has most often been described. I am myself because somebody sees me. And this a quote, the daughter is one of the female archetypes in need of exploration to foster individual and collective healing. Let me also say that in Jungian psychology, the daughter who and her father are oftentimes not discussed, all the more surprising given the fact that Jung had four daughters. Noth none of these dynamics did he touch outside of one essay in Collected Works 4 called The Destiny of the Father in the Life of the Individual. I want to give you a dream of a daughter. The father is like Hitler. He had three daughters and one was suicidal. She is under his thumb. Myself and another sister cry, as she will kill herself, and he does not care. She is a poet, he trashes her work. She ate glass, he will not change. There is a, well, let me read this first. The failure in the paternal holding environment can result in the narcissistic response. This is often based on insecurity as she is maladapted to life's trials and tribulations. Life with others is uneasy as without foundations, she feels flawed. By narcissistic response in this quote, I mean a singularity of being. 
She is alone by herself and does not see others. There is a poet, poetess was, named Ingrid Yonkers from South Africa, who wrote a poem that Nelson Mandela read when he was um, inaugurated. Here is the poem. The child raises his fists against his father in the march of the generations who scream Africa, scream the smell in the streets of, scream the smell of justice and blood in the streets of his armed pride. And when he, he Ingrid Yonker's father, found out that she had committed suicide, he said, it's just as well, they can leave her where she is. This whole story is told in actually in detail in a movie called Black Butterflies. It's quite interesting. If you get Netflix, you can see it on Netflix. Interesting in the sense that it's very sad and goes into detail about one of the disastrous effects of an absent father. The primary context in which betrayal is experienced is the family, for it is there that the first love pact is sealed, a pact that menaces and at the same time makes possible individual psychological behavior. This is by Aldo Cartanuto. He was an Italian Jungian analyst. In other words, where we learn betrayal is in the family. So we can also ask what happens in so many of the case studies that leave off the father when discussing the psychology of the daughter. This is the picture of a dream, actually, it's not an actual dream, but a woman that I worked with who had an absent father. Um, and this is typical, sadly, well, at least typical in the United States that the father might be there for a few years, then he leaves, who knows why, many reasons. She goes to find him when she's a teenager or young adult. She finds him and that's about it. Nothing really changes. This, this daughter, also typical of many daughters who have absent fathers, was in a very unhappy marriage. So by that, I mean lack of intimacy, lack of love, lack of knowing how to love self or other. Again, the narcissistic response. And in her dream, which repeated itself for 15 years, she was on one side of a painting, very mechanistic like this one. He, her very first love, not her husband, her first love, was on the other side of the painting. And she, for all these years, kept on trying to get close to him, to get through the painting, always an obstacle, never a way through. She never got to her love. Quite like this picture as well, where the man who I have assumed could look like a father figure is looking out. None of the figures look at each other very dark, he's in light, but he doesn't look like a light figure. And there is this kind of palette of paint on the side, but no interactive feeling, no eros. And this is one of the sorrows of an absent father. He doesn't have much eros, or he does not know how to express his eros, or, and or he was never taught. He had no opportunity to find his own arrows. Let me read you something that a man wrote to me. Well, first I'll read this. The absence of a father sets a daughter up for anguish and disappointment, often canceling her creativity her endeavors are replaced and stamped with depression, anxiety, and disturbed relationships. So this is what a man said 
about his own experience as a father. He says, as a father of three daughters and the poster boy for the absent father, I recognize how central this theme is in my life. So many generations of which only a couple I am aware, but surely going way, way back have endured and proliferated this phenomenon. The more I understand of it, the better father I will become. I very much intend to break this cycle and buck this culture. This is an image of what so many women carry towards themselves, about themselves. They are shattered. They are broken inside, or they feel that way, or they feel armored against the world because they have not found safety, love, security with the father figure. And the father for generations did not know how to reach out to his daughter, quite like this man, <clears throat> excuse me, wrote to me. She sees the world then <clears throat> fragmented through this kind of eyes that are not really, not whole, things are broken up, chopped up. So we could wonder, and here's another picture of this, and it's of the face. So often there is a feeling I am flawed. I am flawed on the outside. I am flawed on the inside. She has very little opportunity to find her wholeness because she has not been reflected in the face of a father. A daughter who senses that the father cannot tolerate any psychological separateness will attempt to create a state of mental fusion, a projective identification as a means, excuse me, as a means of communication. She tries to please him as the adored darling. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Virginia Woolf. But she also killed herself. She was in her late 40s. And this and she, this is what she wrote about her father. It was the tyrant father, the exacting, the violent, the histrionic, demonstrative, self-centered and self-pitying, the deaf, the appealing, the alternately loved and hated father that dominated me. I am not saying that the absence of the father is the sole contributor to situations like I have mentioned, which are the extreme. But I bring up the extreme because it is a way that we learn. It's straight in front of our face. This is a picture, and I had to put a few pictures in, that is quite sweet. We might imagine this is a father who does see his daughter and who can be close to her. And I bring this in because this shows what is important all the way along the line for the father and the daughter. However, too often she might become like a Puella, which is this image, meaning a girl and then a woman who cannot really inhabit what it is to be a female in all aspects. She stays too young. She's daddy's girl. She always looks to somebody else and she can't look to or find her own stance or her own position. So we could say, and oh, the other thing again, the transgender nature of the absent father. Think yourselves how far back it goes in your own history that the father, was he there? Was the grandfather there? What, what, what were they doing? What about the great grandparents? How far can we go back? And were they participatory in daily life, in loving, in taking her to her soccer games and all kinds of events. Were they allowed or expected to be involved in daily life? 
And I would, even from the absolute beginning, when we read in psychological literature, the mother is always talked about. The father rarely and surely not much from the beginning. And he, skin to skin here, is what is important. It's that skin position. It's the place of, I am present with you, that is oftentimes lacking. And this is also what happens. The, the father or the father figure, let me be general and not be too um, gender specific about the whole thing. Well, it is anyway. But he's on the side getting drunk. And where is the mother and daughter? Distant. And it's this distance, whether it is physical, whether it is emotional, psychological, which hurts the daughter. And I would say it has hurt many generations of daughters. Even from the very early, early life, you can see that gaze which wants a gaze back. It's how we learn how to look at ourselves. And what if no one is looking at us? This also a rather sweet image. And again, many fathers have been able to be there when their daughters were little. And then somehow she gets to be 12 or 13. And then he really is absent because usually he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to express the feelings of his appreciation for his daughter. And so they are like bereft, quite like this image, um, old, dumped over. And what is so amazing is that oftentimes the daughter father is assumed to be a romance. So I just leave that a bit and go to the quote. What she sacrificed to remain in this attachment with her father as it really meant portray, betraying herself and staying daddy's girl because she could not cope with the power of mother and her threat as the other female. She avoided the whole situation by leaning into the father and then the father in a way, took advantage. He said, oh, she's close to me. It's great. But he doesn't know how to encourage her to find her own stance and her own solid female self. Again, a picture that we wish would happen more than it does. A little bit, this might show the love story. Really love story. But the other side of that romance of daughter and father is the unrequited love, unrequited, not fulfilled, and her empty because of it, and he as well. The issue that also happens is that the daughter gets taken with depression, longing, but also idealization. I can't tell you how many people I work with who, when they were little, did the very thing that this little girl is doing. She is waiting for her daddy. Some of them never come. Some of them do and don't give the right attention. But it's that waiting that is so difficult. And these pictures are of little, little girls. This is when it begins. How does she compensate? How does she learn? to have a positive father complex when the father is not there. And when he's not there, she learns to have a negative father complex. Equally, she might, so here's another one from the beginning of life that we really need, dad, very beginning. It's, it's quite beautiful. It would be so lovely if that could be continued and if in so many of the stories, we might hear the presence of a father throughout life. So 
So I want to also add something from French psychoanalyst Andre Green. And this is, this is a quote, it's quite a moving quote. So, lack as absence in the mind, absence of contact, absence of feeling, all these absences can be condensed in the idea of a gap. Instead of referring to a simple void or to something which is missing, the gap becomes the substratum of what is real. In other words, one walks around feeling like there's a hole. Jung says, the things which have the most foi interrompido. Po powerful effect. Seu microfone está ativado agora. Olha, e seu vídeo foi interrompido. Do not... Maria I... Julieta, meu nome aqui. Bota you... aqui. I think that someone's um, phone is... Okay, audio. Most powerful effect upon children do not come from the conscious state of the parents, but from their unconscious background. So we can imagine that how the father feels about the daughter consciously and unconsciously is going to come through to her. How he feels about himself consciously and unconsciously will come through to her and how he feels about his partner will do the same. So the unconscious background which who is aware of is incredibly powerful. Jung has many, many quotes on the effect of the, um, the father on the daughter. Let me, on this one, I just um, want to, this is an image. So it looks like there's a girl here, but who is behind her? I had this idea, and this is my projection, that behind her are male figures. And I want to read you something that a woman wrote about the masculine and the feminine within her. And I bring this up because the daughter learns about these qualities and I don't want them to be interpreted in a rigid, masculine, feminine, male, female, but that we would allow for an entire range of possibilities. We live in a world of flux and we want to honor the flux of the personality. So this is what this woman wrote. The man and woman looked at each other, searching for signs. Are they willing or not to face the truth of the drama? Think about this as an interior position. By this time, they knew they were in it together. Each wondered at the courage of the other, the fragility of the other's mind. Each was tempted to stay and suffer the unfolding. For a moment, their eyes met once more, but doubt possessed them. Courage and desire deserted. They turned and walked out and said goodbye. Neither ever knew what the drama really was about or what truth could have been theirs. And this is one of the effects of the absent father. It's the inability to bring together the elements of the psyche. And this is my image of what it looks like to be in the destitution really destitute of, there's no paternal supply. It's, and it's an old picture, again, because it goes back quite a long way. I included this because this is, I guess, my wish for the father to be able to look at himself and evaluate what is going on inside of his own uh, internal aspects, his own image of his daughter and himself. And she often, again, left with quite like this gate. It's lovely, or it was lovely, but there's all kinds of cracks and crevices, and it's not in such good repair. And this is what people say, in a sense, symbolically, about their relation to their father. You know, when, so it's another Jung, 
it is of course not possible for parents to have no complexes at all. That would be superhuman, but they should at least come to terms with them consciously. They should make it a duty to work out their inner difficulties for the sake of the children. So when I was giving this at one point, a Jungian analyst asked me, why write a book? There have already been books on fathers in Jungian psychology. Three, since 1980. And I said, that's exactly why. Three, since 1980, not enough. So we could say, what is going on unconsciously underneath in the Jungian psychological world that the father has remained somewhat unchallenged or unquestioned? And you see also, this is a painting by Van Gogh and the father too is in despair oftentimes. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't even know who to ask. He is in a way expected and he, he doesn't know. This is because each culture probably has got a different expectation of the father and the daughter, a different expectation of his role. But I would imagine that he is to be involved. And no matter what culture we are in, if our parent paternal is not involved, we are lacking. And it is the lack which sets up distress and keeps that daughter young, quite like this picture, and rather ragged in a psychological sense. Like this, bombed out, empty. Someone just this week said to me, I realized after 40 years that my father, that his absence, which I had just negated and pushed aside and said it didn't matter, but that his absence left me feeling restless existential angst, worry. I gained a hundred pounds. So I say this because the father affects also the body of the daughter, how she cares for herself, how she knows about touch, how she knows about love, and how she learns about intimacy in her life. What kind of damage results from the exclusion of physicality from the father-daughter relationship. Her father's inhibition in handling her, or more so his absence, cannot help but effect the formation of a positive attitude towards her body, a sense of its rightness, beauty, power, integrity. He affects her sexuality and also how she makes contact with the grounds of her own being. You see, we, we have forgotten, or maybe we never knew, that he would affect how the daughter feels about her own physical self. And, you know, so many daughters of many ages, again, this week, a woman of 70, crying because of how her father had treated all of them, the three, again, three daughters, and had yelled at them, had ignored them, had been there, had not been there, sobbing because she knew she needed to get it out and find a better relationship to herself, to her body, and to be able to do what she needs in her life. And again, the touch starts this soon. Just this little hand. He won't get there unless he contemplates and she won't get there unless she lets go of some kind of fantasy that he was marvelous when he was not. And most people do not want to hear it at all even if they felt like this little girl.
Intimacy exposes what she feels as the tattered shards of her personality and endangers the safety of her insulated world. She describes a vacuous space at the center as if nothing was there. Again, another woman this week said, you know, what if, what if, because my father always expected us to be busy all the time, beat us if we weren't doing something. He was like, he was in the military. He was like dictator like, we could never rest. What if, this is as far as I can go. What if I can't understand myself? And what if I can't get closer to my partner? Those are important questions to ask. In another example, I'll give you another example of, or after this, I will. Sylvia Plath was a American poetess in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, in her journal, which is a very detailed account of her internal world, um, she writes quite a bit about her feelings about her father, or a lot of people, much about her father. And she is well known for quite a strong poem called Daddy. She says, you remember you were his favorite when you were little and you used to make up dances to do for him as he lay on the living room couch after supper. You wonder if the absence of an older man in the house has anything to do with your intense craving for male company. I want to say that the absence of her father is, he died when she was eight years old. That absence is often attributed to the fact that she too killed herself at the age of 30. So when I said I was presenting the dark side and the shadow, it certainly is. But also remember, there are times when it isn't all bleak and dark. And this is the rituals of life being passed on to the daughter. This is what we hope would happen. Without con such conscious attention, the parental imagos will exert an influence, often baneful on relationships, romantic prospects, choice of marriage partner, marital success or failure, and a host of significant areas of life. Again, it is quite interesting that Jung wrote so many things about the effect of the parent and, uh, well, maybe he had a lot of reasons for not personalizing it um, at any rate. I, I want to mention a dream that a woman had which I think is very powerful. This one also a dream that she was repeated for 20 years. She dreamt, so uh, I'll read the quote after the dream. She dreamt her father put his hand on her thigh so forcefully that it burned her flesh to the bone. Branded, she could not rise against the resistance of his hand Later, she thought about filling the wound with concrete. How could this wound heal? Concrete would make her flesh inflexible, heavy, and non-human. And the quote, without a nurturing paternal figure, she can be susceptible to invasion by negative images. She might identify with an insufficient father or one completely not there. He does not mirror a range of helpful masculine or feminine qualities. When a father cannot fulfill his daughter's needs for love and attention, self-denigrating habits and moods abound. The woman who had the dream, actually, I found it rather horrifying, terrible. He brands her. Is she cattle? Is, does she belong to him? And she said the dream, toneless, without emotion. And that also 
was disturbing. And interestingly enough, her, in the dream, her repair was to put concrete into the wound. I thought, well, concrete is heavy. It will weigh her down. She won't be free. She's a runner. She won't be able to run. But here is the cultural interesting differences. When I presented this in China, a woman said, but in China, concrete is known for, we associate it with the mud from the earth that it is made of. So I just bring this in to say that we all in a way are limited by our culture. And as we open up, we find many, many different ways of solving issues and of dealing with things. Lee's, this woman's dream represents what is referred to in the I Ching, the hexagram number 18. It is called corruption or work at what has been spoiled or decay, quite like this room. Throughout the hexagram, it calls for attending to what has been spoiled by the father. This entails facing the reality of problems, mucking in the decay, comprehending the deleterious effects of a not their father. The hexagram will demand consciousness to engage with the negative, limiting, and self-effacing patterns. So I want to tell you another dream. And these dreams, although they are personal to the person who dreamt them, we could apply them to ourselves as well. So this woman had a very distant father, distant, distant, very cold. She had to ask permission to go into his library. And in the dream, she um, was on a treadmill and she fell and noticed there was blood flowing up her arms. As she, and she, as she looked, she saw her father's shoes. And as she looked up, she saw her father who said nothing, did nothing. And she was surprised when I said, didn't he offer to help you? Her response was surprise. Her attitude to her own body was, she didn't really care. She didn't mind if she was involved in any kind of debauchery, any kind of anything, she wasn't really present. This is from an American poet, Anne Sexton, who says, why all these doll are all these dolls falling out of the sky? Was there a father or have the planets cut holes in their nets and let our childhood out? Or are we the dolls themselves born but never fed? And I must confess, she also killed herself. And I think why I bring all these very dire stories is again to accentuate the absolute distress that so many daughters feel, do not share with their fathers, or they feel they have to put on the persona mask of I am okay, you don't have to take care of me, I am fine, and she puts that on for the world while underneath is a whole host of confusing thoughts, confusion of self-image, confusion about self. The way out is reopening to the deconstruction of old constructions. This is by Adam Phillips, British Freudian analyst. Analysis disturbs the enclosure in old narratives and upsets the former balance that was imbalance. It is therefore not to resurrect what was, but regain another synthesis 
of the psychological elements. So if we take apart the way the image of the father was, then we also get to reimagine what we would like him to be and what we need. In the process of examining, we really have to look at some very dark issues. We have to look on the dark side because there has been such a portrayal on the other that it's like, let's balance it. And let's look at a truth which is not so beautiful to look at. I'm saying this also not in a blame way, but I would say from the beginning of psychoanalysis, with Freud. Freud also did not have a good relationship with his father. Neither did Jung, neither did many people. And the beginning of psychoanalysis is loaded with the shadow of the father. So all of those psychoanalytical fathers and mothers learned to ignore the father position. This is by Hester Solomon, who was a Freud, a Jungian, British analyst, acts of self-creation occurred through a series of identifications and internalizations constructed around the original sense of internal emptiness. In other words, the daughter with an absent father feels empty inside. She creates herself like a bridge over sand. She creates herself by identifying externally, but not internally, because she feels empty. She feels flawed, and so she has to look outward. And this also causes depression, aloneness, sadness, destruction, unremitting psychological pain. I would say also, um, so this quote is by Jacqueline Rose, who wrote a quite a long book uh, about Sylvia Plath. I believe it's called The Haunting. Um, and this is what she says. This involves engaging with the wounds, reclaiming the damaged parts, and integrating the shadow to dream into one's life and go through experiencing the absence means finding you can do it. In other words, when you go through it, there comes a sense of confidence. I can do it. What opens is a sense of wonderment and freshness, a space of fluidity and flux, the creative expressed, a space of richness, complexity, and establishing her own space. It begins young. And so does the destruction. This one reminded me of so many uh, women, men do too, but women who are into cutting. And I do wonder if there have been any studies on the daughters that cut and where were their fathers. Again, mentioning the body image and the sense of body self which oftentimes is not discussed and is crucial to our lives. Unless we, the less we understand of what our fathers and forefathers sought, the less we understand ourselves. And thus we help with all our might to rob the individual of his roots and his guiding instincts so that he becomes a particle in the mass ruled only by what Nietzsche called the spirit of gravity. So the going into does not mean being stuck in it. It means going into and through and finding something else out of the despair, the pain, the distress, the hiding, the lack of intimacy. From Jung, we are confronted at every new stage in the differentiation of consciousness to which civilization attains with the task of finding a new interpretation appropriate to this stage in order to connect the life of the past with the life of the present, which threatens to slip away from it. 
Otherwise, we can remain like this decimated building. Nothing grows. Or this very sad child who grows up to be quite a sad adult, usually. And all of this brings up the importance of grieving what one did not have, grieving the loss, grieving what was lost, and also acknowledging from the loss what can evolve and what can come forward that will be helpful. Where are you from there? Where are you headed there? What are you doing? Grieving. So I'm just showing you a few images here of what I felt it felt like for this to acknowledge this absence and this struggle it takes to go through to be able to admit it, to talk about it, to share it, to open the doors of it, to allow one to live. Absence, the important thing about absence is what we can build from it. And that within absence, there is a presence. We are all born with certain potential, whatever, it's always there. So how, if we reach into the absence, we will find what is present. Jung knew that children are born into a family matrix that has a multi-generational history. The parents must be viewed as the children of the grandparents. The curse of the house of Atreus is no empty phrase. Addictions, perversions, neurotic behaviors, all these are as likely as genetic problems to be passed down from grandparent to parent to grandchild. And we could ask ourselves, what have we inherited of absence? What did we inherit of presence? What do we need? And do we have the courage to go through all of that and find ourselves? I'm looking for, oh, according to Andre Green, oops, just a second. Ah, come on, go back. According to Andre Green, absence is not absent as it leaves a presence. Absence seeks to be filled, to realize what has been unconscious and references how we do or do not cope. So again, although I have presented a lot of very uh, somber uh, material, I present it with the um, idea and the hope and the knowledge that absence has a presence. And it is that presence that we want to access and that we can access. And from going through the process of learning about ourselves, here's what I was looking for. We actually will find ourselves. This is from Sylvia Plath's poem, Daddy, the very end part of it. If I've killed one man, I've killed two. The vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, seven years, if you want to know. Daddy, you can lie back now. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. On that, I think that I will end, and perhaps we can have Q&A and some comments. Obrigado, Susan. Obrigado. É... Vamos lá. Vamos seguir o... como a gente tem feito até agora. Quem desejar fazer perguntas, escreva seu nome no chat, eu chamo e a pessoa faz. É... Susan, é... muitas questões, né? Muitas questões que você abre. 
queria, queria inaugurar com uma questão clínica e uma um pouco mais teórica. É... Às vezes eu percebo na minha clínica algumas relações muito agudas, tensas e devastadoras entre mães e filhas. E o que eu tenho percebido, e acho que agora, lendo o teu livro, você me ajudado a pensar, é que muitas vezes a ausência do pai arremessa a filha no colo da mãe. Quer dizer, como se essa ausência da figura paterna não deixasse nenhuma, nenhum outro lugar para essa filha ir que não fosse o colo da mãe. Só que em condições muito precárias, muito, muito, muito dramatizadas, e essa, e essa relação mãe-filha tensiona-se, né? fica muito aguda a partir disso. Primeira pergunta, você acha que é possível pensar isso? Que um, um dos efeitos da ausência do pai é arremessar a filha, entre aspas, no colo da mãe? I do think that is, I do think it's also culturally sanctioned and, and almost promoted. Equally, the daughter does not see the parents working it out. She gets a load, she is supposed to then be the father to the mother. She learns to take care of the mother. She learns, she burdened on her shoulders to take care of mother who needs her care. That is the problem. Mother also does not deal with the father. So the father is absent to the mother. And is that the mother's experience of her father that she is carrying onto the partner. Do you hear how convoluted it is? Many, many layers. What happens is that nobody is satisfied and the daughter will then turn against the mother because it's too much. She can't turn against the father because he's not there. And the absence creates a space where the attachment is like this, it's off. If the father was there in the mother's mind and the father had the mother in his mind, they would work it out, it's for them. Too often it goes to the daughter. I, I add one thing to what you were saying because an important comment. When I gave this once, a woman analyst said, I forget to ask about the father. I forget to ask about the father. And when I ask people about fathers, where was your father? He gets one sentence, that's it. And that creates the situation you mentioned, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, one other thing, if you want to, if we would say Jungian terms, um, we could ask who has a neg the negative father complex? Is it the mother? <laughs> And is it the daughter? And is it the father? They all might have a negative mm -hmm. father complex. Yeah. Perfeito, perfeito. É, vou, vou passar para a Luciana Ximenes, depois a gente volta. Lu, contigo, por favor. Oi, Susan. Obrigada pela sua apresentação belíssima. Eu, na verdade, eu tenho duas perguntas. É, a primeira delas é... Eu li um, é, há um tempo atrás o livro do Zoya, o pai, 
E tem um pedaço lá do livro, um trecho do livro, que eu até tentei achar para trazer essa citação para você, mas eu não consegui. Mas que ele dizia algo do tipo que é melhor um, ter um pai ruim do que um pai ausente. E essa citação me, me deixa com um certo estranhamento. Eu queria saber o que, que você acha dessa, dessa sentença aí. E a outra pergunta que eu queria te fazer é, é, é que é muito mais automático a gente relacionar corpo com matéria, com mãe, distúrbio alimentar, sempre com mães, né? E você trouxe essa questão do corpo também nessa relação da ausência do pai, né? Então, eu queria entender se você acha que se a gente pode fazer alguma relação entre distúrbios alimentares e essa ausência paterna. Obrigada, Susan. So, uh, yes, yes, right on all counts. However, um, so all of the women that I mentioned, all of the dreams, every one of them had an eating disorder, every single one. They had an eating disorder at 20 and they had an eating disorder at 70. It didn't, they might have gotten it under, under control, but they had eating disorders, all of them. So does it affect the body? Yes. Is it better to have an absent father, as Luigi Zoya said, or what was it, a brutal father? Zoya. You know what? I don't know that you can compare the badness. I think they're both bad. I think that the effects are similar and I don't think it's good to have either one. I, I think we learn similar ways to cope because we have to, but the people that I have worked with who have had bad fathers and absent fathers, the result is about the same, which is sorrow, trouble with intimacy, body issues. They oftentimes good persona, misery inside. So no, I, I agree with you. I agree. Obrigado, Lu. É, Jamila. Jamila Brasil, contigo, por favor. Está aí, Jamila? Jamila. Oi, eu posso perguntar já em inglês direto, tudo bem? Uh, você se incomoda de fazer em português para todo mundo? É, acho que fica mais fácil. Pode ser? Pode ser. Pode ser. Então tá. É... Nossa, eu quero dizer que em pouco tempo, assim, trouxe tanta conteúdo, estou muito satisfeita, assim, muito obrigada. É... Eu queria depois, se possível, a, se, a referência, eu fiquei muito interessada naquela, naquela, naquele trecho que o Jung fala sobre uma espécie de... É uma neurose hereditária, assim, né, da, da maldição da casa de, Ate, de Atreu, né, eu queria, eu queria saber qual livro, porque eu fiquei muito, muito interessada nesse trecho, mas a minha pergunta é o seguinte, tem tudo a ver com o que a, a outra, a Luciana já falou, é, eu queria, fiquei muito intrigada se haveria uma diferença significativa de um complexo paterno, de um pai ausente, absolutamente ausente, né, inexistente, ou, ou um pai presente, ausente, né? Se existe estruturalmente é, grandes diferenças nessas dinâmicas que se estabelecem na psique da, da mulher. Acho que vou parar por aí. Só respondendo essa já tá bom. Ok. Ok. I am sorry I did not have the reference on the slide. And I don't have the reference in my head. So if you want the reference, email me and I will email it back. I don't know if you have, but 
maybe you can put my email and if anyone has a question, you can surely do that. Okay. Um, and, and the other one, um, oh yes, the, you know, in my experience, just my experience, I don't see a difference. I don't see a difference. I see the amount of depression or sorrow or lack of self, self, lack of self or a creative stop, or a, um, a self-denigration, however the father was absent. So if he was, if he was completely not there, he's completely not there. That also creates absence. I, I give you an example. Um, someone that I, I knew, I met, um, said everyone she knew didn't have a father. She didn't, no one on her block, she got raised on a block somewhere, nobody had a father. So what difference does it make, she said. Nobody has a father, we're all fine. No, because what she was doing, so here's the compensatory piece that we might take from absence. She was making a film on daughters and fathers. So she took this complete absence of the father and made something from it. Somebody else might have a father who seems there, too introverted, doesn't talk about feelings, doesn't ask her about herself, sits silent at dinner, nothing. That also creates about the same depth of nothingness. And that woman also could do something with it. It depends on her other support system. It might depend on her siblings, on her mother, on the world that she lives in. They all have to somehow deal with the absence, whether it's emotional, physical, a brutal father, a father who's absent. Uh, I don't know if there's fathers absent culturally. They seem to take the center stage. So I don't know about that. But I would say that that overarching father is also debilitating because she becomes that Puella young girl. So absence in whichever form means she senses lack, like something's wrong, something's wrong. It's, you can feel it, it's in the cells. We're made of male and female. So if it isn't there, we're gonna miss it. How we learn to cope with the missing pieces is the question that's up for all of us. How do we do it? And that's our challenge because uh, it can be filled, but again, absence doesn't feel very good at all. Obrigado, Jamila. Jamila, se quiser depois voltar com outra pergunta, fica à vontade, tá? Susan, é... o que que permite a um homem tornar-se pai? Eu estava lembrando de um colega terapeuta que coordena um grupo de homens de discussão e ele fez a seguinte pergunta. Eram 20 homens. É, quantos de vocês têm filhos? 12 levantaram a mão. Depois ele refez a pergunta. Quantos de vocês é, são pai? E ele só quatro levantaram a mão. É, o que, que permite que um homem se torne um pai? É claro que o contexto aí é você pensar a partir da ausência dos pais, do pai. O que, que você ouve na clínica sobre isso? Well, so I think that the men in that group were very honest because they could admit they don't know how to do it. 
And how does a man learn to be a father? Culturally, sometimes from religion, family, school, YouTube videos, how to be a father. But mostly they learn by examining their emotions and their own needs for a father. So the father has to look at what did he get and what did he not get? And how did he, <clears throat> excuse me, compensate for what he did not get? Too many men, I'll bet this is true in Brazil, but it's very much the United States. They go into a can't talk about feelings, men don't want to, they just want to talk sports, they're all machos, whatever. And they don't get the support to be able to be in a group like that, which is wonderful, to examine what is a father? Not what was my father, but what was not there, what was there, and how do I want to change it? I, I think we're all charged to move uh, the generations forward and to examine what is really going on inside of us so we can alter what we didn't like and accept what we did like and accentuate that. But it doesn't happen through doing nothing. It happens through a real serious examination of what is a father. And that's true also for the daughters. What is a father? What did I expect? What do I want? What do I need? What do I need? And how will I get my needs met with my current partner, with my friends, with my therapist? How will I get my needs met? One other thing I wanted to mention, this is just tangentially, because you mentioned a group. Um, I don't know how many of you are therapists, but the projection as a father onto me happens quite a bit, a lot. And I am always glad that that father has come into the room, even if he's not so sweet, he's not very nice, he was absent, because at least he's there to be dealt with. So the projection onto the therapist as a father does not only happen with males, it also happens with anybody who's carrying whatever needs to be worked out between and with in the therapeutic process. I mention that because that's not talked about very much either, is the projection onto the female analyst as a father. Equally, male, male therapists, do they get to be mothers? <laughs> it's a similar kind of thing. Of course they do, yes. Tá, perfeito. Uh, Silvana, Silvana Parise. É, então, é um prazer ver a sua apresentação. É, eu lembrei da linda Leonard, é, do livro uh, Mulher Ferida, All right. né? que ela fala da relação pai-filha, e ela fala não só da Puela, mas da Amazona também, como uma, uma possível consequência, né? Quer dizer, da mulher ou ficar, permanecer Puela, ou desenvolver essa, essa coraça né? de Amazona para lidar com esse pai ah. negativo, né? Então, eu queria, se você puder, sei lá, quiser falar disso. E a outra coisa, mais uma coisa, é... Quando você fez aquela pergunta, bom, quem tem o complexo paterno negativo? É a mãe? É a filha? E eu fiquei pensando que nós vivemos numa cultura que tem um complexo paterno negativo muito forte, 
né? A gente está é, tentando resgatar um, um, um pai positivo, né? Você falou, e que está muito, né? Temos um complexo cultural aí, coletivo, de patriarcal, né? De um pai ou, ou ausente, né? Assim, que, o quanto a gente está imerso nisso. Se você puder falar mais também, era isso. Obrigada. Yes, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, um, I, I feel, it's very subjective, I feel that in the United States, there is also a very strong <clears throat> father complex. And I think as we are raised under the who heads everything, the father figure, that... Um, we are all, um, how would I say this? We're all compromised then because the strength of the father wants to stay strong and that would automatically push everybody else down. Doesn't have to be that way, but that is the patriarchal structure or how it has been. Perhaps it is up to us to find another cultural way and another way through the overarching father or blindly following the father or just accepting because. But let me also add that I don't think that the only way, you said Linda Leonard, is there another way to find one's, um, a different relationship to oneself and the negative father complex? And could that be through one's strength of mind, creative, unusual, daring, break the boundaries, and use all the talents that somebody might say, you can't do it. So if you can override the self-denigration and can't do it, it's, it's a workout, but it's definitely worth it. I think in the mind, of the woman is where she can also excel. So she doesn't have to be Amazon or Puella. Maybe she can have a mix of a lot of them. So use the mixture flexibly. Yeah. We got Silvana. Lu, de novo. Suzy, eu tenho mais uma aqui para te fazer. É, eu fiquei pensando que ao longo da sua palestra, teve alguns momentos que você até falou de figura paterna e não de, do pai como homem, né? Mas eu senti que é um pouco difícil Sim. de falar sobre a ausência do pai sem falar do homem, porque geralmente quem fica ausente é o homem. As mulheres, muitas vezes, ocupam esse lugar da ausência paterna, inclusive. É, eu fiquei pensando se isso não é uma herança ainda do patriarcado, sabe? Onde os, é, os homens precisam se ausentar desse lugar familiar e doméstico, vamos dizer assim. Sim, eu acho que os homens têm short shrift on not being able to express their emotionality and their lovingness, their kindness, softness, abilities, um, because it's not really promoted at all. I use the word father figure because uh, when I have given this many times, people have said, well, I'm a single mother. So then are my children automatically lacking the father or people who are of same sex couple or transgender couple. So I brought in that word, I'm glad you focused on it. I did it on purpose because I want us to move out of, I want us to move. I would wish we could move out of narrow boundaries it would free us all. 
So that's why I said father figure, whoever is in that category. You know, sometimes when people have, mm, the father is absent, I'm not saying that the uncle, the person down the street, the grandparent, the teacher at school can't also substitute for finding a, a satisfying model and relationship. But I think the key is what I just said, the person they can relate to, a daughter can feel seen, related and with. And when that isn't there, there's where the tragedy lies. But I do think we have to, um, what should I say? Update our terminology so that we are um, current and beyond current with the world. Susan, é, você acha que, teoricamente, né, em termos teóricos, a gente podia fazer uma construção que fosse a relação de um homem, de, a relação de um pai com sua filha vai depender da relação desse homem com a sua ânima? Quer dizer, é a relação do homem com a sua ânima que irá dizer que tipo de pai ele poderá, poderá vir a ser? Você acha que a gente pode pensar a um triângulo? Pai, filha e o arquétipo da ânima? Yes, but let me add, yes, but let me add to what you're saying. So, how does the father learn about his feminine side? I want to be very loose about what feminine is because I don't want to describe it. It could be a bunch of things. So with whatever is opposite to him, he needs a relationship with. So he can pass that on to the daughter. However, where did he learn to, what was his father's relationship to what is opposite? What was the mother's relationship to the animas or masculine elements? What was her mother's relationship to the masculine elements? And what is the cultural also overlay of how do we put these together? So I'm emphasizing, taking from what you're saying, transgenerational and also How do we update it to our current world? Both. And the triangle that you mentioned, mm -hmm. yes. Because it's very, how do we learn to be male, female, however we describe ourselves? Most of all, how do we learn to be comfortable in our skin and honor being in our skin? That's what really counts. Yes. Ah, perfeito. Ah, Jamila, vamos lá de novo? Ok. Jamila? Yeah. <laughs> Voltei. É, Susan, eu queria que você me falasse um pouco mais sobre a associação que você fez entre essa ausência é, paterna e, e o corpo, porque na, na minha compreensão, essa relação cai mais no campo da autoimagem, que eu costumo associar arquétipos é, masculinos e relacionados ao pai, ao complexo paterno, com o, o, o extrato social, então eu associo mais a autoimagem, então essa mulher que não, ela não é vista pelo pai, então ela começa a, a ter uma relação patológica com a própria autoimagem. Eu queria saber se é isso mesmo, eu queria que você aprofundasse um pouco mais 
nisso que você colocou da relação entre essa ausência paterna e a relação da mulher com o próprio corpo. Um, well, I quite strongly feel that ourselves are certainly connected to our bodies, our mind connected to our body, our soul, whatever we mean by that word, connected to our bodies, and our bodies get us through the world. So if we feel that sense of self inside, we will take care of our bodies. We will honor our physical self. We will know that our bodies are speaking happiness, joy, sorrow, distress. We will learn to listen. So what I meant by the gaze of the father is if the father looks, if you have somebody look at you, they see your whole being. But if that father looks at you like he's being lecherous or he makes terrible sexual comments or when you are 13, he turns away, he is telling you many messages, verbal and not verbal, about what it is to be in touch with, related to your own body. So it is something that is verbal and nonverbal at the same time. And I feel that as in therapy and analysis, unless we address, well, in life, unless we address the seriousness of our bodies and honor our body in our own individual way, individual, not led by what you're supposed to do, but your individual self, then that self and body self get connected very strongly. And we feel solid in who we are. I don't know how you can do self without your body. Um, let me add to that, I give one example. Um, again, from someone this week, I think I mentioned her, um, she gained 100 pounds. Okay, that's an extreme. But you know, what happened? What was that saying about her? But not only did she gain 100, she lost 100. And what does that say about herself? So one says something about herself, the other says something else about herself, equally valuable, equally important to look into and examine. I don't think we can examine the psyche without the body. That's what I would say. Perfeito. Obrigado, Jamila, novamente. Susan, vou ler uma pergunta da Tereza sobre um tema que você acabou de responder, mas eu acho que vale a pena. Ela diz o seguinte, na minha prática clínica, tenho visto filhas que querem compreender o que acontece com seus pais. Até seus 11 anos, o pai brin brincando com elas, pegam no colo, existindo também toques. Quando a menina menstrua, cessam esses toques e carinhos. Eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião, sua visão sobre isso. Right. So that goes a little bit back to the group you were in, Marcus, where the fathers four know how to be fathers. So I wonder, do they do they know how to deal with their 11 year old developing beautiful daughter. Most don't because they also are distant from their own bodies. If they're connected to their body, they can appreciate the beauty of their child and they can help her like her body. They will help her get into, I don't know, 
high, high, high jumping or skating or the Olympics or something. And they will also honor however she wants to look. They will give her honest feedback and they will talk with her. How does she feel about the fact that she, her body is changing? I think it has not been very easy for men because they were not encouraged to be emotionally related through the generations and, as I mentioned, through the psychoanalytic history, very little attention to fathers or their struggles or their um, participation in family life. So where are they going to learn? So what we all learn will help the learning be passed on. I think the questions are being asked now that were not being asked in previous generations, or if they were, they had to be quiet about it. We want now to be louder about it so that that girl at age 11 will learn that her body is precious and she won't deny it. And she won't have to go through who knows what kinds of body disorders in order to find herself. It will short circuit the process of being in touch with herself in a enlivening way. Você acha que é, dentro do próprio campo junguiano, essa questão ela ainda merece maior atenção? Ela ainda se revela tímida, precária, esquecida? É, como, é que você, como é que você analisa o campo junguiano em relação ao uh, do pai? Yeah. Oh, the father. Um, I feel like Again, my subjective viewpoint, I don't think it has been addressed enough. Um, I think there have been a few people that have, but it hasn't. And I don't know if it's because Jung, although he wrote about the influence of the parents a great deal, he didn't do personal so much. He did more collective unconscious, which much of this is lying, I think, in the collective unconscious. I think much more needs to be done. And I think part of that is the, it's not just me that thinks this, but the updating of rather rigid stereotypes of mother is, father is, daughter is, son is, anima, animas, so that the rigidity is moved. But I also want to add that because of, in Jungian psychology, the fairy tales, the legends, the mythology, they are ones that can apply to both men and women. And they teach us how to become unified within. So that to me holds a great deal of hope as well, and people are asking questions. So questions always promote finding answers. So I do think it's needed more and hopefully is happening. Ótimo, ótimo. Gente, espaço para mais duas perguntas. É... Tem a Salete. Salete, quer, quer perguntar o que é que eu leia? Salete? One more question and then I have a quote before we end. Ok? Ok. Yes. Por favor, leia. Tá. Eu vou ler então, peraí. Uh, Juliana, quer falar, Juliana? Juliana? Peraí, 
Peraí. Tá. Então, vamos lá. Vou, vou ler a da Salete, então. É, quando a separação dos pais e a mãe pratica alienação parental, afastando o pai das filhas, as condições psicológicas para as filhas... Peraí, peraí, peraí. Quando há separação dos pais e a mãe pratica alienação parental, afastando o pai das filhas. As consequências psicológicas para as filhas são sintomas equivalentes das citadas até agora pela ausência ou o fato do pai lutar para estar presente surte algum resultado diferente. Ficou? Ficou claro, Isa? Um, would you... Um, I would imagine that if he can keep in touch with his daughter in some kind of a way, it will help the fact of that he's absent. But I would say that it's going to set up a bit of confusion inside of the daughter because if she loves her father or wants to work something out with him, The mother won't want it. Does that mean she has to be against the mother? And then what, in other words, it's, she's going to be left with a lot of convoluted issues similar to the absent father because he's not there. I also wonder, this is kind of legalistic, but don't parents get 50-50 when they are divorced in Brazil? Oh, okay. Well, mm, so not always. Okay, so the reason I say that, look at the cultural difference. It is very usual here that the parents get 50-50. I'm not saying they don't have to deal with the very issue that you're talking about because there's a certain rage, there's anger, there's frustration. Why does the mother have to grab children away from the father? Was he that awful? And doesn't the daughter in her life have to find out what the mother felt what the father felt, most of all, what she felt, and how is she going to balance all of these feelings? It's convoluted, mm -hmm. but there's absence, and the absence, again, seeks to be filled, and that would be the answer. She's going to have to do a lot of work, but we all have to do a lot of work to straighten out the past generations that were not straightened out, so the ones going forward get it a little clearer. Yeah. Okay. Susan, deixa eu contigo agora. Let me just do my um, last quote. Is, okay. is that okay? Unless there is somebody else who has a question. Okay, so this is um, a quote from Jung. Yeah, I think it is Mysterium Conjunctionis, paragraph 190. So Jung stated, just hear this, it's a little long, but it's interesting. If you contemplate your lack of fantasy, of inspiration and inner aliveness, which you feel as sheer stagnation and a barren wilderness and impregnate it with the interest born of alarm at your inner death, then something can take shape in you. For your inner emptiness conceals 
such just as great a fullness, if only you will allow it to penetrate into you. Okay. And I want to thank you all for your attention, the fact that you came, for all of your questions, and for allowing me to, at a distance, connect with Brazil, which I totally appreciate. And I so appreciate that my book will be in Portuguese. I could turn a cartwheel. So it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, nós que agradecemos. Uma honra te receber. É, o tema do seu livro é um tema absolutamente contemporâneo. Né? Alguém, alguém havia posto aqui no grupo, acho que foi a Cris, nossa amiga Cris, que 6% das certidões de nascimento no Brasil não tem o nome do pai. Então, esse é um tema que ele faz parte da realidade cultural, social do país. Então, não é à toa que ele tenha atraído tanta atenção. Obrigado pela tua presença. Quem sabe, né, Aline, quando o livro for lançado, você volta para falar um pouco mais. Foi um prazer te receber. Muito obrigado. Pessoal, obrigado pelo Thank retorno you. ao Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado pelo retorno ao teatro. Sejam todos bem-vindos. A gente começa agora o teatro na sua potência compulsiva. Semana que vem temos Rafael Lopes não Rafael Lopes Pedraza. Temos Eduardo Carvalho falando sobre a importância de Rafael Lopes Pedraza para o mundo junguiano. Tá? Então, a programação eu mandei no grupo. Fiquem sempre atentos nas redes sociais da Luciana Tchmenes, do Tiaços, na minha, que a programação está sempre acontecendo. Um prazer rever a todos. Susan, obrigado novamente. Tá? Grande prazer. Thank you. Isa, Thank you. beijo em você. Lúcio Menes, obrigado de, pela parceria de novo. Até lá, pessoal. Boa noite. Thank you. Bye. Bye.